Mike Bone, please. Thank you, my boys. Let me get the lights down a little bit. Lil Mike and Funny Bone, number one, Funny Bone. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Funny Bone, and this is Lil Mike. There's reasons they got that name. We're going to get into that. But Funny, how you feeling, sir? I'm feeling blessed, man. How about yourself? Likewise, little brother. You know, the thing is, I know that you had some stuff going on in a couple days, and I just want to say we are honored that you're taking the time after falling into a little illness to share your time with us, gentlemen. You're about to inspire an entire classroom of students who are in a class called Media and Society. And after we've had our convos, guys, I couldn't have thought of any two better people to talk about what we're about to get into with. <laughs> so guys, I have a couple questions down. Then I'm just gonna go to my handy dandy smartphone. And I, I, I don't wanna give us any uh, <laughs> questions that we, we already went over in our talk show, that's why. I wanna get some new ones out for us. Give me one second, boys. Right now, just get to my notepad. Okay. These things are so funky, man. Okay, here we go. Sorry. There we are. Gentlemen, can you give a little insight to these brilliant minds in Silicon Valley, California? Where were you boys born and raised, guys? And where are you right now? We're in Oklahoma City. We were born and raised in Oklahoma City. <laughs> and, um... Uh, it's, being that we were raised in the city, uh, it's, it's a lot different than what everybody thinks when you think of Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a lot more city now. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't see us growing up any different. But, um, how old are you? How old are you guys? I'm 29, and Mike is 34. 34 and 29. Now, remember, my scholars, we saw these gentlemen on that premier mainstream show, America's Got Talent. Now, guys, I, I don't want to harp too much on America's Got Talent. I know we've talked about that a lot. But, you know, you're on, you're, you're on the big screen. You guys are looking real good right now. I know you can't see it, but you guys are on the big screen right here. Well, how, how did you guys get on that stage? And how did you get in front of Howard Stern, um, uh, Nick Cannon, Howie Mandel? How did you get to that point, guys? You know what? They actually called us. <laughs> they have producers out there looking for talent, hmm. scouting all this, the whole scene. And uh, they found a video on YouTube of us. Ah. And um, they called us and wanted us to be a part of the show. Um, originally we said no, right off the bat, because uh, a year before that, we had tried out, and they said they were not looking for rap. So <laughs> we got out of there, um, and then they called back and said, no, we're really serious, we want you guys. And um, so we, um, we took it into consideration. And they sent a contract. Hmm. The contract. <laughs> we looked at we looked at a contract the other day. My contract. I told you guys I think a while back with ABC. I was going to be on a show. Really crazy that contract. But what did you see in your contracts, guys? Uh, well, um, it's uh, it was like. Five years, but they could ten. Uh, they could decide to make it ten. So uh, it, it's a long time, and uh, so ten years of control that they would have over you. Pretty much everything you you make, and then I was all the music you make. I was gonna say something you said about the other day. One of my students had a good point the other day. You know, I had, shown yeah. my, I had shown my contract, and um, he had made a point that it's sort of like selling your soul in a way. Yeah. Do you see that, guys? You know, I, and I, we're going to develop this for the audience because they don't know how many contracts you guys have had and how many people have been knocking on your door. I want to get that to everybody. But when you sign those contracts in the world of entertainment, is that analogy, is that fair? Is it like selling your soul metaphorically? I don't think so. Um, it it depends, man. It's in the details, and um, we've had nine different record contracts thrown at us. Uh, we got 
really close with a couple of them. Hmm. But uh, in the end, they wanted to change too much. And uh, changing anything isn't, it wasn't really what we wanted. So we had to get out of there. And uh, I don't know, Mike. <laughs> um, yeah, Mikey, what do you think, yeah, bro? Please. What do you think about those contracts, Mikey? Are those contracts crazy to you? And for everybody here listening in, when they're watching people on television, are those the real people they're seeing, or are those people that are the characters of contracts? Um, well, for a lot of a lot of TV shows that people watch nowadays, some of them might start off good. Like I, I love that repo show. <laughs> yeah. like, sure, time, repo show. Like, hey, this show is the bomb, bro. <laughs>
actually one of the ones that shot him. There was a big fight, and then everybody broke off, and then his friends came back around, and they did it like a drive-by, and he just happened to be standing in the wrong spot, and all of his friends are running over there, like, hey, man, who shot you, man, who shot you? And we're like, this dude is coughing up blood, he finna die. And so we started crying over him and said, hey, dude, if you never had accepted Christ into your life, uh, we just like to give you that chance, you know, in case you don't, you don't, the ambulance don't get here before you pass on. And so we were saying a prayer or whatever, and, um, you know, people were yelling, who shot you, man? We're going to get them. And um, sad to say he passed away. Um, a couple of weeks after that, his mother came up to us and was like, uh, my friends told me what you did. And I just want to say that, um, thank you, but he was a Muslim. And I was like, I, either way, he couldn't talk. He could have accepted it or not accepted it. But, you know what I'm saying, nobody knows in your dying hour what you're going to do. So, um, I, I felt like we were led to pray over dude and give him that chance and, whether he was, you know, going to stay true to his faith or, you know, take a chance to Christ, I don't know, but, you know, that's, I don't know. We just, we like being in the field. That's it, man. <laughs> well, you look kind of good doing it. You gotta say, these guys got some good vibe. Amari, a question? Yeah. Hey, guys, we have a question off out of the gates, if it's okay. One of my students, Amari, yeah. from Sacramento. And now, Amari. Oh, I'll try to focus it so they can see a bit better. That should be good. Hey, Chris, Chris what's up? <laughs> <laughs> what up? Take us away, Shia. Um, I was just wondering to you, why did it matter that he was Muslim or Christian? Why was that a big deal to you? Did you hear that question, guys? Uh, repeat a little bit. So you said the guy was Muslim, right? You guys were mentioning his faith, like why did that matter to you? Like you emphasized it a lot. I think there was a, uh, somebody who said the mother said that okay. he was Muslim. But let me ask the boys. Guys, the question was, you know, did it matter to you that the young man was Muslim? Does it matter to you at all? It, no, it does. It's not a, it's something we're against or nothing. It's just, Something he had to make, uh, a choice he had to make. Yeah, like we don't, um, we're not big on faith fights. I mean, I think any type of faith that you have is gonna empower you to do better. Um, unless you're a Ku Klux Klan member. <laughs> <laughs> good point, boys, good point. <laughs> Although we are 
Christian and we we represent Jesus, uh, similar to like gangbangers, <laughs> but like <laughs> uh, we just you know we have a, a faith in us and, and and something that works that that kept our head strong and whatnot. And everybody has has that you know people have um, whether it is like football. <laughs> You know, I'm on the basketball team, and that keeps my head straight. You know what I'm saying? Or my parents will beat the hell out of me. That'll keep my head straight. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> guys, listen. Yeah. So then now, I'm going to ask you this question, guys. How did you get into hip-hop music? What was it about rap? Now, I'm from your generation, guys, so we, and we talked about this, the good old days of the 90s hip-hop. But is that what got you into hip-hop? Listening to the music at the time? Or was there something else that inspired you? Uh, yeah, I would say music played a big part because when I was listening to music, it was a lot of angry music out there. Um, like I said on the radio show, I listened to like Onyx and Death Metal and Mystical and a lot of angry screaming, yelling people. <laughs> Anybody that was screaming, I liked it. Uh, I think what, 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 what mostly calmed me down. You love my class. class. I'm screaming a lot. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, when I, I got turned into uh, Michael Jackson, I was just like, man, this dude is cool. And he's so aggressive. He's like, just be it, you know? <laughs> I was like, I've never heard a singer sing like that. So I was like, that's cool. And uh, <laughs> and then it just, you know, it, it got me to listening to other styles of music, the way Michael makes music, you know? Uh, we were talking about Michael Jackson the other day, guys. We were talking about MJ the other day. And now listen, listen. You already know where I'm going with it, boys. So, you know, listen. MJ was crucified in the media. We know this. We know what happened to Michael Jackson towards the end. And my point I made the other day was, anybody that hurts a kid, they deserve all of the hardships in their life, and they don't deserve to see the light of day. Now the question is this. Did MJ do that? My scholars, this is where I'd like to delve into the consciousness of some people who have a little other, a different perspective. Guys, what do you think about Michael Jackson? Do you think, do you think that my MJ did that to those kids, or do you think it was the media circus trying to demonize MJ? And if you don't know what Michael Jackson did, guys, Michael Jackson, and just in case my students don't know, a couple of them. And Michael Jackson was has said to have molested, I think it was like two children. Okay. A lot of people were really upset with that, rightfully so. But a lot of people were upset because they didn't believe it. And to this day, it's really ambiguous as to what happened, especially when you read the depositions, when you read what the families had to say about it. What do you guys think about that, guys, regarding the media? Do you think the media took it out of context and, and lied? Or do you think that was what happened? Well, yeah, I think, uh, I think, like, Michael Jackson's accusers basically were just like chasing money. And they were like, he's got enough to just, you know, put up a settlement and, you know, and then just be like, you know, whatever. Or if we win, if we actually win the case, then we'll get even more money. Um, now, I know for a fact because uh, when we worked for YFC, which is a youth, a Christian youth um, organization, um, we used to hang out with kids a lot. We had a teen club, we had, we went to the schools and preached and give them pizza and stuff like that, and uh, they wanted us to mentor the kids or whatever. To us, we're like mentors, like that's so cool and boring, boring. so we was like, man, we just want to hang out. We take, a, take some kids to the movies, take some kids to a, a positive party, um, just to show them, you know, you don't have to, you know, be smoking and drinking and stuff like that. People started noticing us with the kids that we were hanging with. And because of our age, they were automatically saying, oh, they date young girls or, or you know, they, and, and here's the funny thing, they only noticed us hanging out with the girls. <laughs> they mm. never say nothing when we hanging out with the boys. Mm. And now who was saying this? this? Who was saying it? This was people in our own in our own community. Uh, people like I listen. I used to listen to their stuff till they started making on the young girls and stuff like that. And we're like, we don't even freaking date. Like we don't want to do all that until we get married. And you know, we're saying that we 
you know, babies, little shorties there. I'm like, we went at the school. And then, um, but see, I, I, from my mind frame, because we're in the spot right here, I saw how they turned that on Michael Jackson. Because, you know, he had his theme park house thing, whatever. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. What was it called? Oh, man. Neverland. Neverland. Thanks, Cheyenne. Neverland. Right. Like Neverland. Yeah, he had Neverland Ranch. And he, had, he had invited kids to come and hang out. And, you know, he he basically, he wanted to hang with his fans. He didn't want the older fans because they're kind of crazy. <laughs> and uh, so the younger fans, you know, they're, they're more accepting and, and, and innocent. And so, and probably easier to control if they mouth <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I just think, you know, in doing that, people were just like, that's kind of weird for a guy to invite a bunch of kids to his house <laughs> to play. Yeah, that, that would be something that a lot of people would trip out on. They'd be like, well, that's a little strange. And then yeah. well, Michael Jackson, his whole life was strange. You know, from yeah. like 10 years old, he wasn't able to go to a grocery store. You know, imagine, that would be interesting. You know, imagine you had so much fame that you couldn't even walk out of your front door. It would probably affect you. It would probably change the way you see the world. And my guys, my boy, my boys. Now you guys have had doses of fame. You've been seen on mainstream media. You have videos that have tens of thousands to the hundred thousands of views, maybe to the millions yeah. at this point. You know, when did you first start getting into mainstream media? When did that happen, boys? Um, into mainstream media, I would say. Uh, America's Got Talent, um, but for as for local wise, uh, we did a um, we did a song for that chicken spot that dude got shot at called Bobo's Chicken, and that got on the news, and then that got on the radio. And to tell the truth, that wasn't even recorded at a studio. It was recorded under our bed. <laughs> <laughs> when I put it out there, I mean like a bunk bed, and we took the bunk bed out and turned it into a studio so we could use the phone from the top of the bed and it's a soundproof. Because <laughs> we're so small, we fit. No. <laughs> but like, yeah. And it was recorded with a, uh, what was that, a $10 microphone, $5, $5 microphone from a dollar store. From a dollar store. I like that. It was a brand. It said Bose on it. That's so funny. That's so funny. Yeah, that's right. I, I've seen, I've had speakers, both speakers from a dollar store out here, but they're not the speakers I was going to show you right now. That's the same. That's what I had also. It's crazy. But yeah. did America's Got Talent? Did that? Did that change your your career? Just curious. Being on mainstream media. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I say uh, it did change our career uh, because now we're flying to more places. Uh, now we have to, we, after America's Got Talent, we had to get passports because we started getting booked a lot in Canada. Um, and uh, more offers. I mean, we were having record deals thrown at us before America's Got Talent, but the offers got more major uh, after America's Got Talent. And the funny thing is, they just <laughs> they just think we're hungry, so they're just like, hey, they're, they're just going to sign anything, I know it. <laughs> what is it, guys? What is it? Now, this is the piece I really wanted to get into today regarding the contracts. Because I made that mention early on, that when you get a contract in the entertainment business, quite often, they want to control every aspect of you. Now, you might ask, well, Professor, what do they want to control about me? What could they control about me? I live in America. And that's the crazy truth. We live in America, which makes this legally the contract so real. And I know you boys have entertainment lawyers you work with. Guys, yeah. two-part question, my boys. Number one, what's one of the crazier things you've seen in the contract that they wanted you to sign and that would have you know, affected your life? And 
Well, I'll go with that first, because that's a big question right there. What's one crazy thing that you see in contracts? So the students can see that what you watch on television is so controlled, like from the Judge Judy's, my, I had a buddy who was on the Chappelle show, and then Roberto Zuniga. And then he was on a, uh, one of the Univision uh, uh, judge shows. It wasn't like the American judge shows. He was on, I think it was on Univision or Telemundo, one of those. And he told me the whole deal. They called him up, all scripted. What did you guys see in your contract that made you say no way? I'm curious. I got to let them hear this. <laughs> Uh, well, there's this one contract that we were, we actually were very reluctant to start signing for it. Uh, one thing he wanted, uh, it said that, you know, they would be able to control our image. In my head, or in our head, we thought image meant like a logo or the, the, the clothes we were wearing. Yeah, yeah. So. I was like, well, that's cool. They're going to buy our own, you know, clothesline, whatever. Make money off it. I don't care. They can make money off of, of, off the clothes. I just want to make money off the music. <laughs> okay, so we get to, we actually, actually, we signed the contract. Okay, so we, he's, he's like, we're going to hook up and buy a suit. So we go into this meeting, and uh, we get ready to go shopping for a suit. Cause he's gonna have this big old PR thing going and introduce us as his artist or whatever. And he's like, and, we, and then we're gonna stop it at the barber shop and cut your hair off. <laughs> and we're like, hold up! <laughs> Did you just say you gonna cut my hair off? <laughs> he's like, yeah, man. We gotta go with a new image. That way, you know, people will be more accepting. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we gotta go with what the media is already portraying. And whatnot, and we're just looking at him like, who, who did, did you just do that to me? <laughs> <laughs> but that's crazy. Well, he just, yeah, see what I don't do. <laughs> <laughs> but now, when a contract wants to hold and, rec and and dominate your image, guys, I want all of our students to know because again, my boys, many of our students are freshmen, a couple upperclassmen, but many of them really just a couple months, maybe about six months now, out of the high school years. So, some of these students, you know, watched America's Got Talent, you know, when that season you guys were on, and other class as well. And I just want them to really understand, guys, how contracts can dominate the person signing them. How you really lose your control as an artist, and as a person. Like, say you were to sign that contract, guys, and say, you didn't want to wear the suit and tie. You wanted to wear whatever threads you were wearing. What could have happened to you if you went against the contract? Uh, you'd be fined, or you would be kicked off with no privileges of whatever your workings were with that uh, Money. Or with that company. Uh, so if, if we were to put out a CD through them, they would own all that anyway and still be making money off of what we did do this squat. Not only that, we would probably have to come back and rename ourselves because they own the name now. Mm. Um, That's crazy! They might, they might have a pool to the point where any, any performance, any stage areas or, or any venues that book shows or whatever, they can throw your name out there as a, as a blacklist where, you know, you won't be able to, think if people mention your name, they'll be like, oh, we can't work with them. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. So now check it out. My scholars, remember, professor, a regular person, just like little Mike and Funny Bone. But what we do is we follow this dream we have. Little Mike and Funny Bone have a dream to get their music out on the main stages of radio, any venue that will get the mass public listening. And guys, I think that's one of the most important things that we can give to our students. Letting them understand that their dreams are real. I want to ask you guys, you know, I have students right in front of you from Nevada, from Chicago, Cali, all over the place, right here. Boys, you know, regarding media and society, 
You guys have been immersed in the media for the last probably 10 years or so. I've seen a documentary with you guys, and we're going to show the documentary. I'm going to show you guys the documentary over the weekend. Well, I'm going to sign it a little later on for you guys to watch it over the weekend. But guys, I want to ask you, how do you think media is affecting society? Is media a, a positive? Or is now media, is it, is it a detriment? Um, well, somebody in the, in the industry once told us that all media is good media. But <laughs> nowadays, I would say that's not true. <laughs> because if it's, if it's pretty bad stuff, like, you're stuck with that as a brand. Um, yeah, because yeah, it, it, I mean, wow, <laughs> some of the stuff that famous people do and you're just like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and then, you know, people would judge them on that, like, oh, I thought you still were doing that, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, yeah, media is, 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 uh, is basically the forefront. If you want... As an independent artist, media is the number one thing you want, but you always want it to be good. Um, because with the media comes a following. If you don't have followers, record labels won't look at you as somebody that's, you know, willing, they're willing to sign. Um, you got to have good press, like, you know, local newspapers got to be talking about you, uh, uh, Ricky Dick, Hip Hop. Uh, magazines got to be talking about you. Um, and funny thing is, record labels or people who, who actually sign independent artists read these things. Uh, sometimes they go to the to, to the shows and you never know who is watching the show. Okay? We were at a show. Everybody was terrible on stage, okay? There was like 15 people in the crowd. And we were just like, look, man, we're gonna, we're gonna still rock the stage and stay until twelve and sell to, to sell some music to some drunk people because <laughs> when they're drunk, they don't know what they're doing, and we might as well take advantage. <laughs> this is a true story, and I always tell my student body. And guys, and I know you boys, you're right. talking to two guys who don't drink and don't smoke. These guys right here, they keep it funky, they keep it real. So I want you to know that you can have stardom, you can have fame, you can be working your way to the top, and you don't gotta get messed up in anything that'll take you off the focus. I think that's a very important point, especially in the media nowadays that has sex, drugs, not even rock and roll anymore, it's just sex, drugs, more sex and drugs, just inundating the youth with it, you know guys? And I come from your time period where it wasn't like that. But what do you guys think about this idea, my boys? And I'm gonna, I want to ask you one piece. Regarding this idea of what the student body has to look forward to the next 20 years in life. They're working hard right now towards their degrees. And my question is, guys, what advice do you have for these young men and women that have dreams and that are going to achieve their dreams, but they may have some obstacles in their way, guys? What advice do you have for these incredible minds that I'm lucky to stand before and that we're honored to have you guys with us? All right. Uh, well, I'll let him talk because I've been talking. Thanks, Mike. What's he asking exactly? Uh, what, what's some of the train, uh, obstacles that they're going to that could overcome or whatever? Yeah, and what advice, what advice, a fun bone, would you have for all of these students? Any obstacles that come in their way, what advice would you have for them to get past those obstacles so their dreams will become their reality? It's a straight line always goes forward. Uh, don't, try not to let things uh, sidetrack you and pull you off to the side like all that junk, I mean, you don't, you don't need none of that. Don't, don't put all that stuff on you. <laughs> uh, if you correct your mind, the rest will fall in line, you know. Uh, I think also you, the, the, the people you have around you, if they don't support you, um, you know, that, that could be a bad thing. Or even though, if, if you can tell that they're just riding your tail, that can be bad for your uh, uh, business as well. Because now you've got somebody who's trying to take advantage of what you can do. 
advantage of it, they throw you under the bus mm. when everything's go wrong. Saying it was all you and it was actually them and they were working for you. But um uh, but be before you go forward guys, Mike, you said that point that people don't support you. My scholars, you may have people in your life who do support you. And those are the people that you have to lift up. But if there's people that don't support your vision, if there's people that try to hurt you or knock you down, boys, what advice do you have to my student body, our student body, for anybody that tries to stop them from reaching their dreams? Um, anybody that's trying to stop you from reaching your dream, I would say, as long as you're gifted in that area, then keep on pursuing that gift because anyone who's like trying to stop you from, from pursuing your dream or pursuing what you're good at, uh, you just keep going because like either they're, they're jealous of not being able to be as talented as you or they are what the comedy people say, uh, the, what is it? That stand in the crowd and just yell stuff for no reason. Heck oh, yeah, heckers. heckers. Yeah, yeah. Hecklers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Believe it or not. Uh, but music people have hecklers a lot. Like, we got hecklers on YouTube. And the funny thing is, we don't delete y'all's comments. <laughs> we like them. <laughs> we read them, we laugh about it, we like it. And sometimes when they see what, that we like it, they delete their comment. Sometimes. <laughs> Guys, listen, i got to ask you boys, I'm looking behind you and I see a whole bunch of trophies. Just curious, are those awards that you guys have gotten? Yes, sir. Uh, Can you walk us through? Can you walk us through? What are they? What are all those awards? Uh, I have a Celebrity of the Year Award. Where's that one? Which one is that, Mikey? Which one is that? Uh, that would be the Raindrop. The Ranger. Oh, yeah. round of applause, please. I just really good, guys. Hey, listen, the Celebrity of the Year Award, where was that from? And I know you guys also, being Native American, you guys also had some major awards in the Native American community and some of the hip hop best of the West. What words was that, guys? I was trying to read my kids. Hip hop, uh, it was like West Coast Music Awards or something like that. And, um, we got the, uh, what was it, the, it's, a, it's in a plaque in our room, but uh, it was like most uh, something independent artists or something like that. Um, nice. I don't know. We got a lot. We got a lot of awards. <laughs> we did it again. Uh, what was the one, what was the one, guys, that you had? It was the Aboriginal, one of the Aboriginal awards. I think oh, yeah, title. yeah. The Aboriginal, um, Indigenous. That's it. Was it Indigenous? Uh, best in America. You guys are best in America or something like that. Indigenous. Yeah, it was something we did for the Drake Big. Um, or something like that, kiddo. American. Exactly, yeah. kiddo. Still Native uh, American. <laughs> guys, what Native American blood? What Native American bloodline are you boys? Uh, we are Pani and Choctaw. Are you with that? No. Okay, we have a little Native American bloodline in there, so I'm just double checking. <laughs> Sorry, just... <laughs> they say they're so proud. Say, you know, they say that proudly. Yes, sir. You know, one of my students say that you say it very proudly. Uh, why is that, guys? Where's the pride come from? Uh, I mean, <clears throat> anything that you have to do with yourself, you have to be proud of because, I mean, there's too much to be... Uh, resented from, like people say that Native Americans are like witches or, you know, saying they're, you know, uh, you know, they, they're a died out thing, why do you still do that stuff, why do you still smudge, why do you still go to powwows, and truth be told, it's like, if you don't have pride in your heritage, you know what I'm saying, that's like where you came from, like, um, it's kind of like when people celebrate Christmas. It's like, oh man, this, that's, the most, that's the best time because I'm getting gifts and I'm proud about that because I know my family's going to give me gifts. Now, if you don't celebrate 
uh, Christmas, my soul pray I would win. You'd be like, oh man, I like that day. I get to dress up however the hell I want. You know, I'm going out there and I'm going to forget everybody out. <laughs> so, I mean, people have pride in certain things. Our heritage, because we were raised in the city, we weren't raised on a reservation or nothing like that. We never went to a powwow. We never, we never had Indian friends. And we did go to Indian church, but we never made friends with Indian people. Mm-hmm. It was, it was so. The church was so boring. <laughs> they, to me, it was a typical Indian church. They all was off key when they were singing. They sounded <laughs> sad. Mm-hmm. And it just like you know, we we only went there just because our mom made us and whatnot. And when the first time we went to a powwow. We was amazed, and we met a Pawnee dude who came up and talked to us because he he knew our uncle, and he he was he was speaking some of that Pawnee language, <laughs> and uh, and I was just amazed, like dude, this is a part of us that we don't know about, and so you know it just like it sparked a pride in us that we never had before, mm. and you know it, it's just like how Oklahoma City got their they basketball team. And everybody's proud of that team. Yeah. Like, I mean, you can't go nowhere and, and, and be like, what's your favorite basketball team? There'll be the, the few that were dedicated to other teams because we, we yet had an NBA team. But those those that are, that are you know, straight Oklahoma raised, Oklahoma born, straight up, they, if they like Thunder Rook, OKC, all the other ones, you know, ain't nobody, ain't nobody better. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, listen, my boys, I want to ask you one last question, and then I want to see if anybody has any questions from the audience, if anybody does have any. But I want to ask you guys, what are you doing now? Well, first of all, I just want to say, my scholars, I can't thank you all enough for being here. And I really am so proud of you, you know, my phone used the word proud and pride, but i got to say, for you to pick up these ideas, that two gentlemen from where I saw the boys first on America's Got Talent, this is how I met the guys. I was watching television. I watched America's Got Talent. I saw them. I thought they killed it. And I was like, I need them on my talk show. And now, we were buds. You know what I'm saying? That's how I did with Brad Pia, or Brad, or whatever. <laughs> you know? But that's how it works, my scholars. Don't ever sell yourself short. And remember, what you see up here, you work hard. One day, it will be what you live in. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to ask the boys, my, oh, my guys, listen. The next 10 years, what do we got to expect from my phone? Where are we going to see you next? And where can every one of these brilliant students, where, they, where can they find you, boys? Wow, uh, next 10 years, I'll probably still be the same size. I'll have a wall to grow up. <laughs> I'll try not to be the same size, yo. I'll try to shorten this up, yo. You know, like, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stop eating ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mikey. Appreciate that. <laughs> doing tours, uh, hopefully with um, some of our favorite music artists. We're in the process of talking to them about it. Um, Also, uh, Canada loves us, so we'll be back and forth to Canada a lot. Um, They actually have our CDs in stores in Canada. America is kind of harder to get in stores because you got to go through some paperwork. (laughs) Yeah, we understand that paperwork. That's yeah. money. I understand that. We need that uh, distribution deal too. I think uh, is uh, also uh, some sort of distribution. I think uh, I, I know we're working on we're working on the next album right now, uh, and hopefully we'll be working on a rock album as well. Uh, still still looking for a band, and um, you know just you know. We're more like, go for it, go for it all, you know, just doing it all. Well, I'll tell you this, uh, guys. My other half, Lisa, is right over there, and she's, you know, my fiance wife to be. That's who does all the audio on 
the talk show. Maybe she's waiting to hand over there. But uh, oh, hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. <laughs> <laughs> but guys, I tell you, one day we would love to collab with you boys. We'll throw oh, some yeah. nice guitar riffs in the back, some nice harmonies, and you just flow over it. Uh, it would be crazy. <laughs> guys, listen, we have a hand up. Marion, take this way, boss. Yes, funny bone is for you, kiddo. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me more about the distribution deal? More about the distribution deal. What would what would that entail? Well, a distribution deal is is I would say it's better than a record contract because it's automatically somebody that's gonna push your CDs in stores and get you uh, billboards or commercials. Um, but in, in with that, if you ever get a distribution deal, you should also get an entertainment uh, executive or um, the lawyer. somebody uh, get you on uh, talk shows or auditions on movies or something like that because uh, with the um, boost in your CD recognition, people are going to want you to do other things besides music. Interesting. Interesting, guys. So, Marion, that's an that a great question. So, let me ask that next. The hand up, kiddo? Awesome. But that's a really interesting point. So, was the hand up, kiddo? Was the hand up? Oh, sorry, so. But that's wild, guys, that you might be going in for music, but you get that distribution deal, Marion, they're going to want you to go and maybe to the camera, in front of the camera as an actor. Maybe go do a talk show or two. I remember when I did my contract with ABC, I wasn't allowed to talk to any other media source other than the talk shows they wanted me to be on. We'll look at my contract more in depth next week. I know we only got to look at it for a couple minutes the other day, but this is a part of that package distribution deal. How many of you, I see, I was showing hands, curious. How many of you would like to one day be on television? One day have a recording contract or any aspect of media? Show of hands, anybody. We got a couple, we have a couple. We have a couple that followed them up. You have, this is, I'm so proud that they're hearing this, guys, because now you start to see distribution deals. We understand how contracts can be really captivating. First of all, it can make us say, hey, you know what, Jared, we're gonna give you put the thousand sign-on bonus, but we're gonna have to turn your hair blue. You're like, wait a second, man, you know what I'm saying? If you chose you'll do that, but not me, you know? But that's what the trade-off is. And I'm gonna go back to Mario's point the other day. Mario, I'm sorry if you want to bring me up, you know, but it was a good point. So, so <laughs> but that idea of the metaphoric selling the soul. Let me tell you, when I, showed, when I signed my contract, because guys, I signed that contract with ABC. Then I backpedaled, because I realized they could have defamated my character, couldn't make me look anywhere they wanted to, which would have killed me, probably, you know? You guys, I'm a nice guy, you know? Like, I don't have that thick skin like when I was, like, younger. Now I'm, like, really, yeah, I, I, I'm a wimp nowadays. I'm a wimp nowadays, you know? I'm, I'm happy. To the, uh, what they call it, the parties <laughs> involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, hey, they called us a party. <laughs> <laughs> but like, uh, yeah, just like any, any of the money that they, that was given had to be recuperated. Oh, with right. album sales and with album sales and stuff like that? Uh, kind of. Okay, yeah. I, I would say with work in general, because they were talking about just giving us a percent of performance uh, royalties or whatever. Um, so every concert that we did, we get a set price, one thousand dollars. And while well, it could be a sold out venue for like a stadium, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Ten dollars a ticket, right? Yeah, yeah. If there's if there's twenty thousand seats in there and they get ten ten dollars a ticket, in the words of Mike Bowie, get ten thousand for the show. Man, what kind of stuff is that? <laughs> so guys, I just want to say this piece, if I could. We're coming on the time where class is getting to be close to over. And I want to open it up in case anybody else had any other questions. But entertainment lawyers, just so my student body knows, how much, if they ever want to get involved with an entertainment lawyer, how much would an entertainment lawyer go for? How much roundabout did you guys have to pay for that? Oh, wow. Uh, the price varies. We actually know the person, so it's 